Hello everyone. Tonight I'm only one minute late, so uh, I'm improving week by week on these live sessions. I'm just going to wait for a few people to join before I start. It's always nice to have at least one or two people uh, jump in on the live stream uh, and just listen from the start. Uh, in the meantime, I am going to comment about my hairstyle, which is becoming increasingly messy and out of uh, control uh, but through design thinking we can even restyle our hairstyle restyle restyle our hairstyle hey that's pretty cool um, potential t-shirt <laughs> uh, okay so I, i'm actually going to start because diana has been kind enough to join so i'm just going to start oh it's telling me your connection is weak again uh, uh i've got two people uh, fine, let's just trust that this, can, this is going to work. So uh, today, tonight, I'm talking about innovation, applying design thinking to innovation. This is the third aspect of the company, of any company areas, which we spoke about previously. So just go on. Um, so just to give you a recap, um, the company areas are people, systems, innovation, products, money and growth. Now we're talking about innovation and applying design thinking to innovation realm. And so innovation just to start it off, okay, when we talk about innovation, it's really about coming up with a new idea or a process for the company to effectively exploit uh, in an economic sense. Um, so this thing of like coming up with new idea or a process, often the time people think it's just some sort of like esoteric thing that just happens and it certainly can just happen. Often the time people will wake up with some sort of like light bulb that's gone off in their mind and, and um, um, just sort of say, oh, I've got this vision for a new thing that no one else has thought of before and maybe they're able to sketch it down on a piece of paper and come up with uh, a way in which that can be turned into a product or a service or God knows what, and then make money off it. Um, that's great. Uh, I think people like Nikola Tesla were able to do that kind of stuff because he was like a visionary uh, supermind uh, who was able to actually visually prototype, uh, so mentally prototype things in three dimensions uh, before he ever committed them to real world build and execution. Now, I, I can barely see a web page in my mind before um, I build it, let alone a 3D model of a future car engine. Okay, so I can't do that. Uh, I don't know of any other person today who is alive that can do that. So <laughs> just relying on this kind of esoteric enlightenment to hit us is not the most reliable way of coming up with new ideas and processes. <laughs> so uh, how do we do that then? What do we, how do we come up with innovative ideas and processes uh, when we don't have this illuminated esoteric mindset? That's what I'm going to talk about tonight and um, run you through some of the aspects of innovation, what kind of innovation exists, as well as some of the methods that we use to come up with innovative ideas. So let's start with uh, just saying that there are a few types of innovation that exist, uh, which you will hear in sort of management books and stuff like that. So often the time I don't really like to speak about management so much, but hey, um, let's reference them anyway so they'll like management books will talk about there is either marketing innovation or product innovation marketing innovation is about coming up with new stories a new way to sell and promote an existing thing typically in oxford street if you go down to shoe shops uh, especially if you're a man <laughs> looking to buy some shoes You'll go to a shoe shop one, you'll see a pair of black shoes and they have a certain sort of shape to it. And it, they cost 70 pounds. And they're made by 
Russell and Bromley, let's say. It's not seventy pounds is not realistic price. They're probably like Russell and Bromley shoes are probably two hundred pounds. Then you walk down three more shops, you see exactly the same shoe by a different designer who's less known, not designer, but like a design label, um, HMV or whatever. Same exact shoe, exactly the same shoe, different label, and costs hundred pounds. Uh, that's an example of marketing innovation where a brand, a story has managed to achieve double price for exactly the same product. This is coincidentally why a lot of people, a lot of companies put loads and loads of investment into building their brand uh, because they realize that people actually get experiential kick out of wearing Versace suit versus wearing Topshop suit, okay? The power of a brand is such on, a, on our con subconscious mind that we feel better, we feel experientially better wearing a Versace suit than a Topshop suit. Even though they might be very, very similar, both in design, cut, material, the way they fit, etc. Uh, so that's marketing innovation, storytelling, brand, same product underneath, but you know, different story, more aspirational kind of uh, packaging. Then there's the product innovation, which talks about actually, hold on a second, um, we're actually going to build something that works better. Product, which we'll cover next week, as in applying design thinking to products. You come up with a better product where Okay, the story might be after that might be really interesting, but that's not the core point. The core point is the product and the product led sort of approach. So today I just watched um, uh, the story of Chobani yogurt. Uh, a refugee guy from Turkey came to US, no money, no knowledge of business, nothing. He spent two years designing a Greek yogurt formula and recipe. Two years refining it, making it the best possible yogurt, Greek yogurt. A um, few years later, he's worth $1.4 billion um, selling the best Greek yogurt in America. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's a product led innovation uh, where uh, you know, companies will achieve huge success off the back of real functional differentiation which may be accompanied with appropriate storytelling, uh, but the product is the core thing. And design of the product and the concept and the structure of the product is the core leading factor. Um, and then, really, we've got evolutionary and revolutionary innovation. What does that mean? Well, most of the time, when people come up with new ideas or processes, they are typically incrementally better than what's already in the marketplace. And that ev evolutionary innovation is most frequent. In fact, you might argue that there is no such thing as revolutionary innovation because you can't leap the steps of evolution. Like, think evolution just applies to theoretically everything, um, including products and services. Why, does, why do people think this? Well, let's say in terms of like an online bank or a bank, um, if, if people were introduced to online banking concept in a way that was done so that like every bank just shut off their physical branches, that would, lead, that would be like a revolutionary innovation, but it would most likely lead to a situation where most um, customers of banks would just go, what the hell's going on? We don't understand this. We were going into a branch. Now you shut everything off and you're forcing me down this route of using my mobile or using my browser, which I don't trust. Last week I got hacked. I had some sort of virus on there, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what's going on, I lose trust in this and off I go. So revolutionary innovation 
can be very radical. It is radical, but also can be met with lots of um, distrust from customers because the steps is the step is too far out into the unknown for people to accept it quickly. So this is one of the reasons why we could argue that evolutionary innovation is the only way to truly innovate because um, you sort of guide people's mindsets through this kind of process of progression into the new state. We spoke a little bit recently about how design is about moving from current state, which is usually the unwanted state so much, into desired state where we want to be. And so making that huge leap from current state to huge new desired state can lead to people just going, oh, this is too much for me, I can't find my way around. Good example where this happens is, do you remember those times when Facebook would change the position of something? They might like move the search bar to somewhere else or you know, move the navigation from left to right and, and people just freak out. It's like, oh my God, this is too much. Uh, so what they would typically do is they would uh, then bit by bit move things from one side to the other so that people don't really recognize this change and they incrementally get used to this new state of being. Uh, so um, that's how uh, evolutionary approach applies to create a revolutionary situation. F uh, famously also I think Amazon had changed their kind of brand colors uh, from one color to another but sort of making this change in a radical way would have been too much for people who are kind of used to that sort of Amazon purplish or whatever. And so what they decided to do is kind of fade the colors bit by bit over a period of time into a new color to sort of adapt people's minds into this. Uh, that's just an example of a small, relatively small change where it can have a huge impact on people's perception of the business as a whole, company. Uh, so... And there's another concept in, in innovation, uh, when I was working with American Express Innovation Labs, <laughs> one of the first uh, um, exercises we had carried out is to come up with 100 ideas around what American Express could do to create new products and services, something really cool, radical, interesting, innovative, relevant, and so on. 100 ideas, we thought we're really, really coming up with new stuff here. We're breaking new ground. We're really changing the game. <laughs> and then we started really researching the market for each one of these ideas. Really, we went to compare the market. And then we realized for every single of 100 ideas, there was at least 20 to 30 existing players in the market who have been in the market for 10 years, four or five years, existing clients, existing stories, existing brand, really well executed, well designed, kind of businesses that we were thinking like, I wouldn't mind going working here, you know, it's like really cool. And we thought we came up with a new idea. We're like 10 years behind some of these people. And so the, the, the concept here is that there really are no new ideas. Every single idea you can come up with has already been not just thought up by someone else, but actually it's being executed by 20, 30 other businesses worldwide and they like people often find like making loads of money already from it. And so you might actually believe that there are no new ideas. Um, so if that's ever stopping you from innovating or doing stuff, uh, I would suggest don't let that stop you because really kind of it isn't about the new ideas, but it's about how it's executed in real world. And so what I want to move into is talk about some of the methods in which we innovate uh, without relying on this esoteric light bulb moment that Nikola Tesla would have, but actually innovate in a way that's more controlled and process driven and structured. And really, 
that we can sort of shape and direct in a way we like as opposed to wait for some sort of circumstance to arise. So one of the things in design thinking that is very powerful and well known is the concept of reframing. Um, so typically whenever I work with clients, um, they would say, we, we want an app. We want an app. Uh, our problem is we don't have an app and we need an app. And the, it sounds, this sounds really weird, we need a nap. <laughs> like nap as in sleep <laughs> it's like yeah take a bit of sleep and maybe some new idea will hit you on the head um, they need an app like a downloadable app uh, and what I hear is you don't need an app uh, you, you, you need something that is actually going to help your people your customers your users live a better life it may be an app but before you jump into that conclusion, you actually need to understand what your people first want to need and then design for those wants and needs. Uh, Anthony saying today, uh, uh, I think UX will evolve with the standards, meaning that UX role, roles will move to more of a conduit or mediator who just channels the business and the users. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting... Um, take on, on, on things. I, I can see where you're coming from and, and that's, that's an interesting thing to just talk about that where, where things are heading. Uh, so, so in design thinking we use reframing as a concept of saying hold on before you jump into defining what the problem is we might want to reframe that, redefine it, okay, to to really understand what the true problem is. And most of the time, businesses will, will think that one thing is a problem, but actually what the real problem is is something that uh, requires a little bit more insight, and it's either a bigger or it can be a smaller thing, and could be easier ways of, of, of solving issues, uh, but it isn't the thing that the business originally thought was, was the solution for it. So reframing is a, is a very important method in design thinking. Now, um, also two types of innovation that, that we can talk about is horizontal innovation, where companies look at widening the spectrum of things that they offer. So, for example, with UX Coach, we are, our core business is about coaching people design thinking. That's kind of what I'm doing here in some respect. Um, that's our core thing, but if we wanted to innovate around that because people ask us, what else do you do? What else do you do? I was like, well, we coach people design thinking. It's like the Chobani guy sells yogurt and he makes $1.4 billion uh, worth for himself just selling yogurt. You don't need to now sell kebabs as well, you know? Yogurt is good enough. Uh, so well, our, our yogurt is design thinking coaching, right? But if we wanted to do horizontal um, innovation, we could say, well, okay, we're going to design think coaching, uh, coach people design thinking, but then we're also going to design solutions, and then we're also going to implement solutions, and then we're also going to support solutions. And this kind of horizontal spread of services gives us kind of wider appeal across the industry versus we just coach people design thinking. Vertical innovation would be to say we coach people design thinking but we go so deep 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 and in, into details of this that like there's not going to be any resource in the history of mankind that's going to go so deep into design thinking on every single aspect of it and nook and cranny that you know if you ever want to reference design thinking you're gonna have to go to UX coach resource of some sort to reference some minuscule question about it and that's really what we're looking to do really we're looking to create a very deep resource on design thinking because it, in itself it's quite a broad spectrum of, of thoughts and ideas and mindsets. So 
that's the kind of approach we're, we're taking and that's that takes a long time to create that depth of content and insights and processes that kind of guide people to say because often the time we we come across people who are architects by nature or business people or you know all sorts of, they come from different angles so they're like how do I use this and leverage this from my perspective into my realm of business and so on and it's all good questions we need to be able to answer that and and coach people around that and we can do that in face to face way but um, that's not very easily replicable into more automated formats like online university and so on. So that's going to be a challenge to design it in a way that is very accessible, usable, friendly, uh, but also addresses all sorts of different nooks and crannies of where design thinking is relevant. And so one of the other ways in which we can innovate is by skipping the problem altogether. and where um, there's an example here being was like a shipping uh, sorry, a company that was selling motorbikes to India or something like that or electric bikes to India I think it was an example I can't remember exact company they had this issue of like we can't ship these bikes to India from America they were building them and uh, so so it was the issue was, okay, we can build a bike, but we can't ship it because it costs so much money, it's not viable, etc., etc. So what they did, because the bike is like a big thing, it takes a lot of uh, container space, etc. And it was like, okay, well, our business is not viable because we can't ship it to the target country and maybe we should just close this down. And then someone said, well, actually, let's just skip this problem altogether and deliver the bike in parts so we could just cram it into a smaller box we deliver it in parts and then the person who's buying it in India can just assemble it themselves so they skip the problem of shipping problem and they just let the customer at the end put it together like IKEA things and so there you go skip the problem innovation cool all works great um, the other way in which we can innovate is to really understand the future trends, where things are, um, where things are heading. Um, typically, like Jeff Bezos would talk about, there are things that I would expect my customers to always want. For example, no customer will ever want slower shipping times, delivery times. Everyone wants faster delivery times. This is one of the reasons why Amazon is looking into drone deliveries and so on. Um, the other stuff that Jeff Bezos would say is like, I don't ever expect my customers to want to pay more money for the same product. They want to pay less money for the same product. Um, typically, people will want to do things faster, better, to higher quality rather than slower, worse, and worse quality and higher price. So some of these things we know are, are given. Uh, but there's other future trends that we can foresee. Uh, so right now, things like, for example, Snapchat are going crazy big. We can sit on the side and, and kind of just ignore it and go, oh, it's just like a little kid's thing and so on. But then we know people who are having 15 million views a month and they're leveraging that hugely into their business and instead of kind of ignoring Snapchat as a platform we could actually embrace that and go hey 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 let's start really focusing our business to play with this medium much better than it currently is is, is lending itself to do so uh, we already kind of know that for example something like Snapchat is likely to stay and become more and more prominent way of both communicating with customers and people uh, as well as delivering all sorts of cool things. Uh, they, they, they're playing around with Snap Cash uh, which is a way of paying for things. So it's like, okay, so I can actually receive payments through this. This is really serious. Uh, and we can see that coming as a, as a thing, right? And we can point our business in that direction to be compatible with it. So these kind of future trends and understanding them and playing into them is very powerful. Uh, huge aspect of design thinking is experimenting, continuous experimentation. At any point in time in my life, uh, 
and then hello hello how are you um, yes we're doing design thinking lecture <laughs> uh, so at any point in time in my life I'm running anywhere between 10 to 20 experiments on different things right this right now this thing is an experiment I want to see how many people watch this stream I want to see if I can deliver them on the regular every week um, I want to see what it looks like. I want to know what I sound like. I want to know what I say. I want to know if I can freestyle a good enough um, session for an hour that's of value and deliver it and then leverage that into other realms. Um, I also want to learn through teaching and coaching. I'm always learning. So experimentation is a crucial part of design thinking skill set an approach and more we experiment trial and error kind of failures little small co um, concerted fails right and ex experiments more we learn about okay hold on we gave this to 10 people and um, uh, Farhan Rahman did you schedule in the session and why others along before starting uh, yeah, there are events in the group which are set up, so I'm doing this on Wednesday evenings, the London time, and you'll be able to watch on, on replay. Uh, so, so, experimenting in controlled environments, let's say, let's give this to 10 people, see what happens, or let's build something, and there's a concept of dog fooding, using our own service to see if we, we can really get to use it and like it. Uh, this is something that continuously runs in designers' minds and, and, and behavior. So we should continuously be experimenting with small things that we can increment into bigger and bigger experiments based on our learning. Uh, that always yields innovation of some sort. Um, the next thing is what I call lateral inspiration. Mm, T-shirt lateral inspiration. Uh, what that is talking about is using other realms as inspiration to innovate inside our own realm. So for example, what's a good example of this? A lot of things in music work nicely for just general business. So you will see that, like for example, people like Gary V talk about the hustle, which is experienced typically in hip hop world, where hip hop rappers they will like bootleg their uh, CDs and and records from their cars. You know they, you know, to to sort of struggle through their career and kind of build their career and fan base and so on. That is immediately transposable into any business realm where it's a question it's basically that's lean startup but it, that's transposable directly into other businesses where it's like how can we bootleg um, 20 or, or 30 versions of our offering right with no marketing nothing right get a bunch of customers use them as a core fan base and then get them 30 versions of our product and so on and like really organically build it that's sort of an example of lateral inspiration but you'll see that like um, uh, in in the world of um, for example in the world of travel you might have some sort of comp you, you might see like a, a comparison engine appear in the travel market um, which makes it easier and quicker for people to compare tickets across different airlines and then a year later you see that comparison engine appears in insurance market as well why because people go like hey this kind of idea can be transposed into this whole different industry because it's really useful and, and usable uh, so so that's lateral inspiration uh, to sum it up, I was, I was going to talk last about biomimicry, but really biomimicry is another example of this lateral inspiration where biomimicry stands for um, imitating biological world and then building products and services off the back of how things work in living world.
So you might observe the way ants build their ant hives, uh, ant hills, and then you can use that as inspiration to how your company should be managed. Uh, and Farhan saying biomimicry is phenomenal. Biomimicry, you'll see a lot of it used in the world of aircrafts and all those kind of things where designers of aircrafts will often identify and look at the ways in which birds use their wings and things like that to really kind of fly and glide along and so on so they'll look to mimic the way the shapes of the wings are and so on to um, to build aircraft that have similar sort of properties um, but biomimicry can also be used in digital services as well to see how uh, sort of ideas spread uh, between viruses for example how, how viruses uh, proliferate and then we can look at the ways in which we can make that sort of mechanic work across memes in social media or products and so on so this is where um, for example Facebook viral loop of like inviting seven friends uh, might have been inspired from and so on. Uh, the next thing that we can do is a process called game storming which is thought up by Dave Gray which is one of the respect to most most respected UX designer innovation sort of consultants is a friend of mine on Facebook um, he runs a company called Explain um, and so he came up with a book called Game Storming where we come up with games which we can play to play through some problems and methods and, um, and, and challenges and through a game we come up with new ideas through fun, through jokes, um, we come up with new ideas inevitably and then we can take those new ideas and new concepts into, into more uh, pr procedural refinement to structure them up. Uh, so game storming very cool and what they did even with game storming they they created a community of other people who kind of then chuck in their own games that they've invented um, to help this sort of innovation process uh, the next con the next way in which we can innovate is what the idea called uh, well concept called idea sex <laughs> and this is this is something that picked up from James Altucher uh, who's one of the kind of podcasters, a uh, bit of a crazy guy, but has lots of interesting points to make about life. He wrote a post about idea sex, where he says, the way to come up with new cool ideas is to take one thing and another thing, sex them together, and what you come up with is, is something brand new. Um, um, so... What's a good con what's a good idea? Like what's something that's come off idea sex? I can't think of an example at the moment, but it's like saying, what if we blend? You can go crazy in this, but you say like, what if we blend roses with plastic bottles? What do you get? And then you start coming up with ideas around that. It's like rose bottles. I don't know. It's like can can a bottle be shaped as a rose? What if a bottle was shaped as a rose? What do you get? Um, or what, what, what if we blend uh, chili peppers with uh, oranges, you know, you get this, these kind of cool things like chili chocolate and chili orange chocolate and so on. Uh, yeah, mo idea sex, mobile and a camera, you know, what if you splice this together and you get mobile cameras and mobile smartphones. Um, so a lot of the time, cool ideas can spring off just blending two random concepts together and um, um, you know really taking it forward in many respects UX coach is a bit of a kind of idea sex because we're saying we're gonna blend coaching as a method of teaching people which isn't kind of prescriptive prescriptive and design thinking which is a mindset skill set blend these together and then coach people design thinking as opposed to teach people design thinking. So um, that's a bit of an idea sex thing, but not so like wild uh, and unrelated. Um, the other way in which we can innovate is through deep analytics, uh, analysis of deep analytics. Now this is what um, Katrina was alluding to that as you 
do user testing or even with um, analytics packages that you have, you can actually spot patterns of behavior. I'm going to take a little bit of water because my throat is drying up. You can spot patterns of behavior in analytics packages. So you run your website, even if it's like, you can make one page uh, web concept, it's just like, you come up with an idea sex thing or like rose, or like, or what, what's it that like people came up with like uh, Shoreditch Air, right? A, bo uh, a, uh, a um, glass jar of Shoreditch Air and they put price on it. You can cut, create that as like one pager, you put it up, it costs nothing and it takes like 20 minutes to put together if you're slow. And you post it up on your social media and you run analytics on it and and you then see in the analytics how many people visited it, what kind of people, um, um, what kind of people have visited it, how long they looked at it, what they looked at, and you can start spotting patterns and really deriving out of that insights that drive the innovation further. Uh, so, and uh, if you're working on um, if you are working on a big, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, big company, big concept and so on, then you'll often have Google Analytics or other analytics packages that give you loads of insights into behaviors of all sorts of different people. And if it's well tagged system, you'll get all sorts of insights of who is visiting, what they're looking for, why they're coming there, where they're coming from, what marketing uh, uh, activity they've followed through on and then how they are uh, consuming the service of the back of that, where they're exiting. They, this can go crazy. Like it, with analytics, you can derive so much insight. Often the time you won't really, um, um, you won't really understand why people are doing this, but you will certainly understand how many people are looking at what and sort of the funnels, how they traverse through services and so on. Uh, this is a huge realm and that's why they're like specialist analytics consultants that like really specialize in breaking down um, stats and so on but then also deriving insights from them and really proposing actionable innovation steps that could be taken and I've certainly spent years of my life really marrying up analytics insights with user testing insights to say, ah, when we put this stuff in front of users and they, they're they failing this and go, ah, I hate this, I don't want to do this because I'm, com I'm com um, concerned about my privacy, I don't want to log into a bank with my Facebook account so that they then think that the government is tracking their, their earnings, right? Um, and it's like, I don't want to do this, it's like, the stats will show you that people drop off at the registration step, but user testing will tell you they're dropping off because they don't want to log in with Facebook. Okay. And so you get from user testing, you will get insights as to why from analytics, you will see exactly how many people will drop off at any point in time. Blending these together, quantitative and qualitative insight blend them together. You get full picture as to what needs to be actioned on in terms of innovation. Uh, so that's analytics. Then we've got deep immersion. This is a, this is a cool one that's kind of uh, become a little bit more popular nowadays. Why is this? Because many businesses at the moment now are trying to design services that are much more complicated than the services of the times past. 10 years ago, it was like, oh, let's build a website. Let's put our products online and people buy it. And, and, and then I remember, I remember very well, people used to say, the only kind of thing you're going to be able to sell online is uh, books. Okay, books and CDs, books and CDs, that's it. Web is for books and CDs. Web, triple equals books and CDs. Today, people are selling everything online. Like I worked on PokerStars.com. People bet on casino products. First deposit, 70,000 pounds. First sign up. People put money into anything over the web nowadays. And with virtual reality and stuff, there'll be even more stuff that you sell. 
people sell coaching packages through Snapchat. Um, you know, people sell cars like Tesla sells cars online. You know, other companies sells cars cars online. Huge items, huge ticket items. I've worked with wealth management firms where people say I've got million pounds to deposit into your account for wealth management off the back of the internet. Uh, so. The point is here that with deep immersion, what people do is like they go, like, what else can we sell online and how can we do this? What will it take for people to buy through online channels for designers to really understand the kind of pain points and the, the, the friction points? They really need to deeply immerse themselves into the situation that they're serving for. Uh, but also like to design products and services that really work for those environments. So for example, if someone's designing a system that's helping uh, tracking uh, stock levels in restaurants, how many onions are left, how many sea bass are left, how many oysters are left, so that the chefs understand, hold on, hold on, I can't really build, I can't really cook the oyster dish because we only have one oyster left in the in the fridge. So take that dish off the menu to build that kind of stock management thing for restaurants. Designers are having to go and act like chefs for three weeks, deep immerse themselves into the chef's job to really understand what the chefs are doing, what pain points they have, how much they are having to do all sorts of different things. And where the hell would they have like some sort of screen where they're pressing number, pressing buttons to see how many onions are left in the fridge. That's not really what chefs want. How do you come up with a service that just kind of tells them whether they can cook a dish or not? Is there enough stock or not? And if there isn't, just give them one button that they press, um, uh, just one button that they press to order more onions and, you know, make it fast. Uh, so that's deep immersion. Often the time you'll see like designers get deep immersed into health related uh, products and services where patients are being treated with very, very uh, uncomfortable tools and um, machines, right, which cause a lot of pain, suffering, etc. So designers will go through like wearing some sort of catheter, you know, that's really awkward. You have to insert it into where it's places which you don't want to insert it into they really feel that pain and they go there must be a better way of doing this you know and they come up with innovative ideas on how to how to deal with that um, and so the next step the in way, way in which we can in, uh, innovate is through ethnographic observation uh, ethnographic observation is the concept of like looking at what people do just observing them so famously there was a documentary about how Adidas scouts would just walk around different places and observe what teenagers and young people are wearing and spot trends as to what is the next up and coming thing that people will want to wear. Uh, so, so some of these people are so good at ethnographic observation and they will be able to look at a teenager wearing a leather jacket and they will immediately know to know what shoes they're wearing based on what jacket they're wearing. Or they'll see someone and based on their demographic or, or, or age or even sort of race and skin color and all these kind of things, they'll go like, this person is likely wearing this type of a shoe and they'll look down and it is that type of a shoe. Uh, but what they're then also observing for is what is the next shoe those people are looking to wear so that they can feed that back into Adidas factories and designers, industrial designers, to come up with that next shoe that people are really looking to wear with the rest of their clothing based on the trends that are happening. And people get, uh, people get uh, employed just to do this across the world. So I've actually met recently a team of five people who just travel the world doing ethnographic observations for fashion brands and they're just like observing dozens and dozens hundreds of people in a certain age bracket and going we went to Japan we saw thousand teenagers and this is the trends that they're into now feed that back we went to Netherlands and we saw thousand teenagers there this is the trends there we went to Belgium and saw thousand teenagers this is the trends and they'll take pictures of this they'll like really construct insightful 
actionable uh, research pieces that then designers can design around and give those teenagers the next shoe that they're looking for. Ethnographic observation is an incredibly powerful way of getting innovation ideas. And it can be done not just physically. I remember doing this on Bo at Bupa for two days. We sat on the calls, sales calls at Bupa, and just listened in to people calling and inquiring about health insurance. Um, so we just listened into what people were saying and understanding their pain points, what they complained about, what they didn't understand, what they wanted more information on, uh, what their circumstances were. And we even instructed the salespeople at Bupa to ask specific questions, research questions, to give us better understanding of those people's contextual situation so that we can design better for those. Um, so that's ethnographic observation, can be done physically, remotely. Sometimes I'll do ethnographic observations just by watching YouTube videos. When I was working with Rowley, I did ethnographic observation just by Googling up various producers uh, on YouTube and just seeing them talk about, this is the kit that I have, this is what I love, I work like this, this is my room, it's not so, so big, it's small, and so on. Uh, 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 some interesting comments coming in. I'll, I'll respond to them afterwards. I, I, I noticed I'm going on quite long with this because there's a lot to talk about. Uh, and so, um, the, so that, that's ethnographic observation. The, the last thing that I want to talk about in here before I start wrapping up and maybe take some comments um, and, and take this into a little bit of conversation is you can go over the old ideas that you've had, revisit them and get inspiration from that because, um, you know, I, I think the story is that iPad done by Apple was something that was like a concept sitting at Apple for like three years before it was really taken into production uh, process. Uh, that's a great example of something that was done as a, some sort of sketch or concept and so on, put on the shelf, it's like too early for this, no one wants it, no one gets it, doesn't suit Apple as a company to roll this kind of product range. But then three years later, someone picked it up and was like, wow, this is cool, this is a good time for this, let's revisit, let's, let's iterate and let's put it out there. Uh, so. Don't ever chuck away your sketches and ideas. Always have them in the pile uh, somewhere. And you know, if you're really uh, if you're really struggling for ideas, go over the stuff that you were thinking three, four years ago. You might laugh at it and go like, "Oh my God, I can't believe it's so dumb." But actually, the way I would do this today, and then it kind of just follows on from there, and you come up with some cool thing um, that really makes sense. So. Don't chuck away old ideas because they could be the best new idea that you come up with uh, and innovate around. So I'm going to take some que uh, questions or comments uh, and for next sort of five minutes. Uh, and so please, if you have if you have innovation related questions, please ask me and I'll answer. It's, I'm live, people. I'm live. This is like real me. I'm here right now. You've got the opportunity to ask a question. Can you ask a question? I'm going to run a whole session on just asking questions <laughs> because one thing I notice all the time is that people don't know how to ask questions. Um, they're really bad at asking questions. Uh, could be something to do with innovative mind as well. Um, Okay, so I'm going to scroll up to some of the previous questions uh, that were asked. Uh, I hope and trust that you have found this useful. It's certainly been useful for me to um, to go through all these points and just list them down because uh, a lot of these points we coach about in our coaching sessions. Uh, but we look at really how to do them and how to integrate them into all sorts of um, all sorts of aspects of both your life and professional Barbara life. Wants to know what about cradle to cradle thinking? Okay, so cradle to cradle thinking is an interesting one. Um, it's looking at the life life cycle of 
a customer. Cradle, it was Cradle to Grave that McDonald's came up with, where they said, look, we want people to eat McDonald's from when they're born till they die. And, <laughs> and so they're like, how can we sell McDonald's to a baby and sell McDonald's to a 90 year old person and have them eat McDonald's throughout their whole life. It's like the ultimate, what well, it used to be called the ultimate marketing kind of 360 thinking, right? And then someone went, that's not good enough. We should be doing cradle to cradle marketing. And what's that? It's about concept of, if McDonald's were doing this, we want to sell McDonald's to a baby until they're a, an old person, but then we also want to sell to their babies as well, right? So from cradle to another cradle, and we want to have this like multi-generation selling. Um, this is an interesting thing where, uh, you know, we can take just this concept as an inspiration towards your uh, innovative thinking and say, instead of, um, instead of just selling to people for their lifetime, why don't we sell to people for their lifetime and their children's lifetime and their children's children's lifetime? Uh, it's out there, but for industries, for example, like wealth management, where people are like, we got our wealth, we also want our children to manage their wealth in a way this kind of cradle to cradle very relevant, but also many big businesses are thinking this long, long term to, um, uh, to, to, to really ensure that their businesses are sustainable for generations to come, <laughs> cradle to cradle. Interesting. Uh, Last question. Okay. Is why did you just, why did you want to get involved in design thinking? Why did I want to get involved in design thinking? Uh, not really related so much to innovation, but I'll answer it anyway is um, I spent years of my life designing different products and services and uh, it's been uh, it's been tough right because we come up with new innovative ideas is is related to innovation we'll come up with new innovative ideas and you know what you meet people in the company that are working who just laugh it off Be why because they haven't done any of this stuff that I spoke about. They haven't done any of it, and they're just coming from their own reference point. I was thinking about this the other day, actually, because um, the stuff that surrounds us, that we observe all the time, today I did a talk at Sky TV, and it was, it, it was about design thinking and sort of dispersing design thinking through Sky TV. And, and I was thinking about, like, People have been watching television for a long, long time in the same way, right? But then really it's changed somewhat. Um, it's changed somewhat in recent years, but really it's like you sit at a, some sort of screen and you consume visual material, like entertainment material. And so I was thinking like, how do you, uh, how do you innovate that beyond that sort of screen interaction, you know? And I was then thinking like, you know, we're so like, um, in, uh, in, in our minds, this in engraved thinking of like, whatever we observe, we just, uh, you know, believe that that's really how things ought to work. So it's sometimes really hard to break out of this, uh, the way that it's worked for thousands of years or hundreds of decades, right? Uh, it's really hard to break out of that and come up with new ideas and new new solutions. So why I got involved in design thinking as my core thing is because I realized that, you know, for us to progress in this world, we really need to continuously upgrade the way we live our lives um, in all realms of existence. And for that to happen, it's not just good enough for me to be thinking with these mindsets and these uh, methods. Other people need to embrace this as well, because ultimately, what's the point of existence if, 
this this is the issue that we've ended up in capitalist system where like a handful of people got trillions of dollars and the rest of the people uh you know the rest of the population is struggling on minimum income and they have no idea how to um how to create a better life for themselves why because they're not equipped with the design thinking mindset to actually bit by bit experiment and innovate and create more value for both themselves and certainly the the people that they're looking to serve they don't even understand that the real value in terms of monetary value will come from other people they're expecting money to fall into their laps just by magic right the only way you're going to make money is by serving somebody else who's going to give you that money. And then you realize, oh, who are those people that I want to serve? What are they like? What do they want? What are their pain points? What are their aspirations? You know? And so I've known this for a long time. For me, this has been kind of a natural way of approaching things. But then I come across loads and loads of people who don't think like this. And they're just like opposing, 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 opposing. And so some of the things that come up and thought up three, four years ago, right, and proposed to people and said, this is the solution to your uh, problem. They've gone, no, we don't like this. It's nonsense, blah, blah, blah. And then four years later, they've gone, We've come up with this solution and so on. It's like, yeah, that's what I proposed to you four years ago. You weren't ready to mentally accept it because you didn't do any of these exercises and innovation. And now working on that solution is too late because 125 other companies are already doing it much better and they've locked in the market. So design thinking ensures that you are continuously competitive and relevant in the marketplace. Uh, without it being a magic thing that just springs out of um, 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 so so okay Farhan is saying cradle to cradle was the idea of outputs of one industry being the inputs of another industry to create zero waste uh, this is called circular economy uh, but so the point on design thinking is that like other people need to embrace this mindset for us to collectively, collectively um, um, improve our existence. Because it's no good if one person has trillion dollars and another person is struggling to buy bread. That's too dispersed. It's much nicer if we're somewhere there, you know, together, kind of enjoying collective prosperity. The notion of circular economy is very interesting also, somewhat related to innovation. Um, actually, we could say it's hugely related to innovation because many companies have realized that, and this is if you see with Apple, you'll, you'll see this, that they're encouraging sort of uh, bringing all devices back to Apple and sort of recycling them and so on. Um, the idea that like if a company sells you especially physical product um, they know that eventually that product will fail and it'll break down it will run its course life course so they don't want you to chuck it away actually when you're talking about mcdonald's i often have this issue around mcdonald's where you see you know kids will have mcdonald's and then chuck the mcdonald's um boxes onto the floor the reason why i have issue with that is obviously the pollution that it creates but also if you think about it mcdonald's brand ends up being trampled on on the on the street that's not what mcdonald's wants they don't want people to walk on their brand on their logo so i'm thinking like they have a design opportunity here to sort of somehow incentivize these kids and people who eat McDonald's to put this stuff at least into rubbish or create some sort of drop off points where people can drop their McDonald's boxes or make them usable for something else, encourage that sort of recycling. So the circular economy is talking about how a company can close this loop of selling, a, creating a product, selling it, having the customer use it and, and use it till the end of its life cycle and then reuse the materials and components and so on to make the next product that feeds back into, into its loop. Um, and there's a huge driver in industries 
certainly the ones that are polluting a lot to actually stop polluting and saying, hold on, this point at which we pollute should be reframed as an opportunity to continue the life cycle of the product and close that loop and bring the stuff back to us to recycle, reuse or create some other things uh, that can be beneficial to mankind. So example being that, um, you know, if a company is using lots of car cardboard boxes uh, to ship their products, that cardboard is wastage um, which would be just sort of chucked into a landfill or whatever but that cardboard could actually be used to make other products so you see like people have made cardboard helmets for bikes that are actually better health and safety wise uh, than, than regular helmets and they cost a fraction of the, of the, of the cost so that's an example of where certain wastage products can be actually leveraged as materials to build other things that can both save lives, create better life quality, as well as just not pollute the planet, which is a ter terrible thing, obviously, for all of us, because long term, polluting the planet will kill us all. So nobody's going to be doing any business with anyone because we'll all be dead. <laughs> okay, so planet pollution is not a wise thing. Uh, because we'll want to do business for a long time, there won't be any cradle to cradle if we kill our offspring. <laughs> okay, so innovation with design thinking, structured process, intentional process, repeatable process, fun process through games and game, game storming, uh, yields lots of cool results, potentially no new ideas, but we can come up with with cool stuff. Thank you so much for your comments. Thanks so much for watching and participating. I trust this has been of use and value to you. Uh, I will respond separately also to comments later on. Uh, next week we are going to be talking about products and applying design thinking to products development. Also this week on Saturday, I think we might still have one or two spots available for uh, coach, uh, design thinking workshop. If we're not, then there's a, a, uh, um, another workshop we're running on 10th of December, next Saturday. Uh, so reach out to us if you want to get coached and design thinking properly in depth with practical exercises and uh, insights and explanations around how all this works. Thank you so much for listening and see you next week.